Okay, we're going to do an overview of the to do and then what this week is all about remembering that we really have three classes. Monday, Wednesday, this week, Monday, next week, and then the following Wednesday, the 11th is Veterans Day. So we have a catch up day. So let's, I'm just going to do a screen share and we'll look at our modules. And if I found that if I go to the desktop, it's easier to move things around. So Here's our week, uh, 11, this is October, November already, 2nd through 7th. And our last week we had, um, whoa, sorry about that, you guys, um, our to-do. So here's our overview and to-do. So this week is, you have a couple things from Crew Handbook to catch up on. We're gonna do a dressing list for one male you have a picture of a male, and you can do one contemporary female, and I'll put that in there, contemporary. Remember your, how I organized the um, procurement plan, where you're gonna find these items, what your budget would be, how to budget those items, and then you can create from that a pull list. If something is gonna come from costume stock, you would put it in a pull list. We'll talk about how you would do virtual fittings, and we've had to do some. For today, you had to read chapter three, and you're going to review this fabric identification lecture if you need some help, and then we'll begin our paper weaves. And let me go to the next one. So this is uh, from, this is not published, that's why you're not seeing it. Okay, so this is the compilation of the fabric identification notebook and swatch kit. You're going to have your small swatches that we're going to work with. We're going to work with that whole packet that you guys were given at the um, beginning of the semester, and I will review that whole piece so that you can understand that. But this page is the assignment page. This is where you're going to want to find everything. I'm going to open this, and then I'm going to go back through each element so that you're not confused. And then if this is a burn test, um, lecture that I did last semester that we will do a separate burn test lecture here, but if you want to go ahead, you can look at that. So here is a fabric identification notebook. And this is what we will do. Uh, let me see if I can make it a little bigger. Better? So you'll look at the cat fabric identification rubric first. Everyone got one of those in your packet. It's the small um, I'll just show you here, as you can see in my window. Actually, let's, uh, let me do this. Okay. So this is the rubric that was a quarter sheet. It looks like it's a full sheet because I'm holding it up, okay? So that's something you'll want to review the fabric identification rubric so that you understand how to organize your fabric identification project. Instruction for weaves. There are, is a page that gives you instruction for weaves and that's on this page right here. Weave sample descriptions. Again, that's on this page. It's each numbered item corresponds to your fabric samples. So we're gonna have to go through that one at a time. And every sample is gonna be mounted on a piece of grid paper which is this, okay? And that paper you'll have, we'll organize it and it'll say plain weave and it will be samples so that you'll have one, two, three, four, five, six and so forth. And then you'll have one page for twill weave, one page for satin weave and one page for non-wovens. Then you're going to do a burn test and I'll go through the whole burn test. That's not something you're gonna do on your own, but you can watch the video and lecture on that. And then guess for your burn test, what you're going to do. You will find three thread samples and put them on the bottom of your satin fabric sample page. And here's some ideas about what you could use. And then you'll write an introduction to be as the a beginning of your fabric identification project, but it's gonna happen. Actually, it's probably more like a summary because it'll be what you experienced, but it will also talk about why fabric identification is important. So that will help. 
because then when someone looks at your whole project, it will be, um, it will say why this is important. And everybody has a great time with this. So that is, and I just developed this this spring. So that is your, the whole compilation of it. This is the instruction for the weaves. And I'm gonna go over these today with you. You'll do three paper weaving samples, plain weave, twill weave, and satin weave. These are described in your textbook as well. Your required supplies, we'll take a break so you can get them together. And when we get to this point, so everybody can really understand exactly how to do this. And you'll group in pairs. This is how to do it. And this is a description of what it looks like. And this is a this is one plain weave. This is a um, variation of a plain weave called hop sacking. How to make a twill weave. This is a twill weave. How to make a satin weave. And then these are the descriptions. These are the very specific things you need to do by row. So don't worry about understanding that right this second. This is something we are going to go over together as a lab today. Okay. And then we have the burn test. This is also in your textbook. It discusses how to find identifying fibers so that you can understand each of these very specific fibers. How do you know what they are? Why is that important? Here is the burn test protocol. So this is how we set it up before we ever do any kind of burn test. Taking a while. Here we go. So these are things that you want to do so that you can see them. And in this, uh, if you watch this video, you'll see I worked with a partner and we were in two different locations and I narrated it and then she executed. So you can see this is exactly what we need to do. And this is what I will demonstrate this as well so that you can then identify those fibers that we've discussed. That's the lecture. Here's the weaves. I think this is the same. Ha, I think I uploaded that twice, right? Sample description. Let's see. Yeah, okay. So I don't think we need to do this again, but let me just double check and see if it's the same. And if it is, I'll remove it and I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. Okay, very good. So this is the description and we will go through this in class and this will be a lab class where you will have your grid paper, your very first sample where it says start here, number one, plain weave, cheesecloth, and it, there's a description, number one, and that's what it is gonna be, it'll be glue sticked onto here. So Kara said today, oh, are we gonna to have to give those back? No, you're going to be able to identify each one of those samples based on what we sent you. And then you'll have it in a book so that you can refer to it ever after. So that's gonna be a really cool thing. It's like your sewing portfolio. If you ever wonder about why you, uh, what fiber something might be, then you can refer back to your fabric identification notebook. And there's a lot of reasons why we need to do this. For example, we often get garments that we don't know what the fiber is. Fiber identification was really a very recent thing. You know, when you look inside for a tag in a garment and you see an ID, that's something that's happened very recently. So um, that's gonna be something we go through each time. So, for this assignment, you'll be creating an illustrated version of a fabric swatch book. Fabric swatches are numbered and will be provided in the same order as the lecture indicated. So these are very carefully in your um, safety pins. Don't undo them. Use these fabric swatches to mount into the notebook. A title page should read an illustrated fabric notebook. Your name, guidelines. This gives you your guidelines. You have flexibility. You can put it in an alternate format rather than a ring binder if you like. And then this is the grading criteria that's based on your rubric right here. So all of it's in here. 
and you'll see that there's a part on um, fabrics and fabric stores. That's an extra credit thing, and I think you've got that. So here's the description of the swatches. You will get every single one of these in your book, and that's your upload due on November the 16th. So you have two full weeks to complete it. Okay, let me see if there's one other thing here. Let me just, oh, this is the rubric. So there you go, you've got it. And I also sent it to you. Um, so this is the organization of it. And of course, my usual points. So this total is 50. And right here, when it says content and quality, this is the content checklist for that. And the um, burn test, okay? And then extras. So I think that I've um, given you a fabric store list with your pattern. Uh, I gave you the thread count information. Let me show you what that looks like. Should be on the back of this. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna, now I'm gonna stop share. So what do you think? Pretty fun, huh? So this is your, this is your rubric that's there. That assignment page is gonna be super helpful. You have four of these, which we'll label for, our, for your fabric identification swatches, your small fabric squares. This is the fabric count page that everyone got, and it discusses the um, lengthwise, crosswise grain, and how we how we get the number of threads per square inch. And then this is just a fabric store list for here that you want to include. And then I've included, if you've never been to Los Angeles for the fabric fashion district, the fabrics really are just out on the street and you can really take advantage of them. So these things are just very helpful to go into your fabric notebook. Questions on that? No? Okay, very good. So I think I gave you a copy of the lecture. Did you guys get a copy of the lecture in your book, in your um, packet? I wonder. See a lecture. Yeah, I know. Let me just um, let me just go back. Let me just pause for a second. I'll go back and check if there's new. We're going to go to the um, weave section so that we can begin making the paper weaves, and I'll screen share that so that we go to the paper weaves. So. Instruction for weaves. And can everyone see my screen? We'll be doing these yeah. plain weave, twill weave, and satin weave. So let's look at the required supplies. And you'll need paper scissors, contrasting paper. And I have some yellow paper here. You can just use anything. And please feel free to use the back of something as your white paper. So it can be any scratch paper will work fine. And for example, you could use newsprint and white. So I'm going to give you some time to get these um, samples together. And then we will discuss how to create the weave. You'll need scissors. You'll need a ruler and a pencil. The tape is helpful and I'll show you why when we make the weave. So we're gonna take, can everyone get those together maybe in five minutes? Hopefully the, the alternating paper might be a problem, but I guess I could color on one side. Oh, you know what you can do? Easily, you can do one page that's printed and one page that's not. Oh, okay. That would be completely fine. Okay. It'll be completely fine. And when you see the demo, you'll understand. You don't need to have, uh, it can be 
just as long as the two papers are different so that you can see the difference when we weave them together, that's completely okay. Okay. And let's, uh, let's just take five and please get these things in bold together. And we will uh, start with our plain B starting there and with these instructions. So I'm gonna put those up on the board. All right, please get those. Yes, uh, Spencer, you can leave by 11, I think 11.45, absolutely, so that's fine. And then we'll get those together. Okay, but I'll be a little bit, I'll be a little bit late for the makeup. Okay, to make our paper weaves, we're gonna go from the required supply list as it's listed on Canvas. You need paper scissors. You need paper, four pieces, two plain, two other, whether that's colored, whether that's print, whether that's something else. There we go. A ruler, a pencil, and tape. It's helpful, not mandatory, but it is helpful. So I have my items right here. Sorry for reaching in front of you. I have two pieces of paper that are colored, two white scratch paper. We just use any old scratch paper works. So, you know, it doesn't matter. Anything is fine. I have my scissors, my ruler and my pencil and my tape. I know this is kind of funny, but this is my tape. Okay, the very first thing that you're going to do is take each of the four pieces of paper and cut in half by folding the long side together so that you end up with one piece that's eight and a half and another piece that is five and a half, okay? So you're gonna fold and then you will cut those in half. Fold in half, cut. So that then you have two pieces five and a half by eight and a half. Okay, so go ahead and do that. I'm gonna fold mine and I'll just show you how I'm doing that on the table. By folding it. Here's my 11 folded in half. If I make my corners match exactly, then I have it in half exactly so that my page is very even. And then if you take something rigid and run it over that, you have a very firm line, okay? I fold it back the other way and run something rigid. I don't necessarily even need to cut it. I can actually tear it on that line very, very easily. So they're perfectly um, even. And we're gonna do this two times so that you end up with four pieces like this of colored, four pieces like this of white. So here's two more colored and here's white. This is an example of when I did uh, a print piece and a plain piece. So, like this. Okay. All right. Once you get that far, you're going to use your, your printed or alternate paper as the warp. That is going to be the warp piece. So this will be our warp piece. Okay. And draw a one inch line across one and a half down from the top and mark one, in, one half inch 
across the bottom of that line so that you get one continuous line, okay? So let me show you how to do that. I'm going to mark one and a half inches down from the top. I'm using a see-through ruler, so I can just mark it this way, or I can mark it uh, another way. I can mark it like this and do one and a half, okay? One and a half, one and a half. So if you don't have a see-through ruler, you can just mark the traditional way. If you have a see-through ruler, go ahead and put it at one and a half and just draw your line across. I'm going to then mark my increments Let me just hide that. Okay. I'm going to mark my increments so that you can see that I'm marking one half inch all the way across. So one half inch at the top. If you don't have a see-through ruler, you have to do top and bottom. And then I can go across and do top and bottom. If you have a see-through ruler, you can just mark your one half inch and draw your line across from the bottom of my one and a half inch line all the way to the top. So I will continue drawing my line for all four sheets of color or alternate paper and all four sheets of white paper. So if you wanna use white printing paper for your white paper, and you wanna use your four sheets of recycled paper for your alternate print paper, that's completely okay. So you'll end up with a sheet that has an even number of one half inch lines across it. And because this is, it should be exactly that, but of course it's not gonna be exactly that. So I'm gonna mark that, okay. And I'll cut that off so that I have my sheet with all my lines completely matching. Once you do this to all eight pieces, you will then cut along that line up to that one and a half inch increment. And you'll cut all these so that you, it looks like you're making a bunch of grass skirts. So we'll have the plane. And we'll have the colored. The colored is going to be the warp threads. Be sure that you label that. That is the lengthwise grain. So this is the warp, is the lengthwise grain. You're gonna have this grass skirt. And the weft is the crosswise grain. And you'll have the same increments all the way across and then you will cut them. Does that make sense to everybody? That's the first thing we're gonna do. So go ahead and take time and do that now. And then we will start weaving together so that you can see the plain weave. All right, I'm gonna screen share how you can find the lecture notes and the lecture uh, from recording from today. And let's take a look at that screen share. So here we are week nine, your overview. The, here's the assignment. Remember it has the pencil, the, how you compile the Fabric ID notebook. Here's your Fabric Identification lecture notes and the recording from today will be posted here. This is where we're gonna start talking about, this is a, a very simple loom. You can see that here's the warp threads and here is the weft going across. And this is a, um, 
also a plain weave. You can see warp threads group together. Remember warp is lengthwise grain and crosswise grain goes across. And if it wraps around, it creates a selvage. Okay, so this is creating a selvage. Often the crosswise grain is looser and that's why it has slightly more stretch as we've discussed all along because here is the color or the detail is added in the crosswise grain. This is the lecture note so that you, I will lecture from this after we do our weaves today so that you can be working on your weaves while I lecture and you will be able to reference our fibers and our man-made fibers, our synthetic and our fabric finishes. So these are the notes that you can look at. We will be working with the warp and weft and salvage edges, the kinds of yarn, which is the fiber, the, the weaves, which we discussed, plain weave, a variation is basket weave, the twill weave, and the satin weave. So we're going to start right here with our weaves, but I want you to see where you can find the lecture notes. That's weird that Oh, I see, it's just, it's just slid over. <laughs> I thought, why did it go off the screen? Okay, and then, we, then there's a wide variety of looms that we will be looking at. The warp threads are the threads that are, um, that go for a long ways. This creates the, these threads are the lifting threads to lift up alternate, um, warps so that it can weave in a certain pattern. And if you look at this bar right here, you can see that they're tied on so that when they use these foot pedals, they can lift different things. We'll talk about that in detail. The warp threads are the long lengthwise threads that go forever and ever. There's, they're on spools in the back and they wrap around. This is lifters so that you can see how it works. These are warp threads going down. This is a backstrap loom done by hand. Again, backstrap meaning it's it could be taken off of this and rolled up. Whoops, sorry. Let me go back to our canvas page. And a finger loom. Hanks of yarn ready to be uh, rolled into spools so that they can be put into a loom. These are hanging down actually, and they're going to go into a loom. And then our assignment. Okay. So let's go to our weaves section now. And I will demo this as we discuss. Again, going back to, I should have just gone back one page, sorry. Go to your weaves section when you have a question. And it will be instructions for weaves. When you get this, the three samples in paper, the first thing that we do is cut on the lines, which you've done, group them into pairs, which you have one white piece and one alternate piece, label them weft and warp, and then we will assemble the leaves, the weaves. So I'm gonna stop the screen share now. This is your instruction about rows and I'm going to show you how that works. Here's where the tape is important. I find it easier if we can tape this flat. If you tape your warp down, it's easier to work on. So the warp is always vertical and it you can see that it is up and down. So vertical, meaning it goes along the body, right? So you can see that. Tape that flat on your table. And then the weft is going to go across in this fashion. And you can tape that on your table. This will just help control. We're making a paper loom.
And once you do this, you will really begin to understand this is what a fabric actually looks like. So following our instructions, we're going to create this pattern. And the instructions indicate, and I'm just gonna to go to that so I make sure that I tell you exactly what they say. You've laid the warp down vertically, the weft at 90 degrees, which is horizontal, and we're going to go over one, under one, over one, under one. Each one of these represents a yarn, and this represents a warp yarn. I'm gonna go over one yarn, under one, over one, under one, over one, under one, and you start seeing the pattern emerge. So I've done my first row and I have over one, under one. The next row needs to be, or row, this is row one, row two will be opposite. So first, I will be going under one. Now, if these are bugging you, you can simply tape them out of the way loosely because we'll be using them, but you can just get them out of the way by grouping them together so that they're not bothering you. And now I'm gonna go under one, over one, under one, over one, under one, over one. So this is my crosswise grain weaving through my loom on the warp. Does that make sense to everybody? And then you can see that I am creating this plain weave pattern, which is the system of over one, under one, over one, under one. And then you repeat. So then row three, is the same as row one. I go over, under, over, under, over, under. And you can clearly see when you have made a mistake because your pattern will no longer be symmetrical. So when I get this all tidied up, you'll have a complete plain weave. And then you want to label this as plain weave. So then the um, indicator is to repeat through the end of your page, the end of your strips, making sure that they're all up very tidy. Okay, then that gets mounted once it's completed on a piece of paper with the warp and weft clearly marked and plain weave marked at the top. So you will then put this on top of a page that can then go into your notebook once you've completed that pattern. Is that making sense to everyone? Yes, I'm just not as fast as you weaving. You, okay. don't, you do not have to complete it right now. I'm just giving you the demo of it, okay? So this would be for plain weave only. You don't have to have it finished. When you will finish it eventually, but I wanna make sure that you understand how it works. So I'm going to go to the next weave and just show you um, how that works. Let me screen share for a minute so that you can see where we're at. So this is what I just demoed, over one, under one. Basket weave is an alternate. If you do a basket weave as well, you can have extra credit and you see it says extra credit here. And these are the instructions that I just uh, clarified. Over, under, over one, under one. Row three repeats row one. Row four repeats, row two, continue until all the weft is woven. Does that make sense for everybody? So you're gonna do four, you're actually gonna do, you, you will have materials to do four weaves, you're required to do three, the plain weave, 
the twill weave and the satin weave. So there's your um, plain weave. Here are the instructions for twill. I'm gonna demo that. And here's what the twill weave looks like. The herringbone is extra credit. And then the satin weave. And here's what the satin weave looks like. Okay, and there's the description and it's quite long. It takes eight rows and then you repeat eight. But we'll start with the twill next. And you will have three total. You're going to have the plain weave, which I did first, twill weave, and satin weave. You have enough paper to do one extra credit and you can do more if you wanted to do, I'll give you some extra credits. So under plain, you can do basket, under twill, you can do herringbone. And we will discuss each of these two in your fabric samples. And in satin weave, you can also do sateen. Sorry. Which is the reverse. So there are several. Let's take a look at doing this twill weave because it is more complex. So I'm just gonna reuse this piece so that you can clearly see it. I think everyone can clearly see it, yeah. And because it has multiple rows. So we're going to go through, I'll unweave this. Don't you guys unweave yours because you have paper to do each one of these. I'm just doing this for the demo. So you'll complete that over one, under one, over one, under one for your plain weave. And then, excellent. Check that off. The next one you wanna do is the twill. And this will be one that we can label and put on a piece of paper, just like we did the plain weave, just like this. But now it's gonna say twill weave. So the first row, I'm reading it off of the, off of the um, canvas site so you know exactly how to do it over two, under two, okay? Over two, under two, and that's my first row. The next row, over one, under two. And then we complete over two, under two, over two, and you end up with under one. And you can see I'm offsetting it. Just confirming. And then the next one, I will start under two, over two. So now I'm at the reverse. You have to not let those bug you, even though you wanna straighten them out. I know that they are wiggly. So next I'm doing under and then over. And then I'm going to do under one from a row four. Each one of these is a row, under one, over two, under two, over two, and then continue on. And then once I get to row four for row five, through eight, I repeat. So number five, I'm gonna undo my pieces over here. And I will go over two, under two, over two, under two. So where it says repeat, then you have to do the same exact thing. And now you see that I'm making a strong diagonal. So rows five through eight, which would be continuing on, you'll just continue the same pattern as rows one, two, three, and four. So this is the twill weave creating a strong diagonal. Remember, this is our bias. There are some characteristics of the twill weave, which we'll be discussing, because the twill weave has the straight of grain, which is the warp, 
no stretch. The crosswise grain, which has some ease because it is generally a weaker fiber, but then the nature of the weaving creates this bias, which is a diagonal so that this is the weave that's used for blue jeans. And you will have the two color weave. The, the um, warp is white. The traditional warp is white and the blue would be the weft. And they're worn in the, in the diagonal of the twill. And that gave even regular blue jeans a slight ease. So not stretch that we would recognize as our, our lycra stretch or spandex stretch, but definitely an ease. And you can remember that you could put your jeans on tight and then they would kind of stretch out over time. So if I'm going on with my row six, I'm going to actually repeat what we did above. So I'm just going to do over one, under two. Like this. And then I'm going to do three under, over. And don't worry about it being a little loose to begin with because you will tighten it up and you will get everything um, in very crisp order once we get all of our rows completely parallel. Okay, then I'm going to create, uh, what am I on? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, and then my next one is over one, under one, over two. Wait, I'm not there. Okay, let's see, what do I do next? I think I do, oh, I just did under two over one. Now I do under one over two. Sorry about that, you guys. I'm reading and doing this on the board. So this is, you want to follow what's in your canvas page exactly so that we get this beautiful diagonal finish. And then I'm going to repeat my top, which I do over one under one. Why do I spend time doing this? Because once you do this yourselves, you will clearly understand what a twill weave is and you get to see this very beautiful pattern of diagonal lines and that is why we get the stretch in there. All right, so there's my full twill. I'm ready to fold these back and tidy them up put them on my page that says twill. And then this is exactly following the instructions on Canvas. And you will just go ahead and follow your instructions on Canvas so that you can get each one of these done. And you can see my strong diagonal now going all the way down. It's really, I don't know, poetic. But now you remember we just, we cut our bias strip. Look at this, boom, your bias strip right on the twill. So those are our Three weaves, you're going to do your satin weave on your own. Let me know if you get stuck. You have three extra credits that you can do here, and that will help for your, um, that will help for your notebook. Now I'm going to screen share. Let's go to the lecture notes, and you will see the lecture notes, and you can make notes on those if you wish. And is everyone at a point where you can pause your um, weaving. Yeah, I stopped just so I could watch the twill. So Okay, okay. And the twill is really beautiful, isn't it? It's gorgeous, yeah. I mean, and the thing is, is that we're going to get, you have fabric samples that are twill, and you'll be able to see the strong diagonal. And then herringbone is when it goes like this. So it's really very, very cool. There's also a variation of the twill called um, hound's tooth. So that's quite fun as well. Well, I was thinking when you were doing the weaving, do you walk around stores and when you pick up something and you know the material, do you like in your head start going two under, one over, two under, one oh, over? Uh, no, I don't do that. I do think about, is it a plain weave, a twill, a satin? Is it a pile, a plush? You're gonna, you'll be familiar with all of those terms. 
And then the non-woven is a huge category now because it is a, um, it's a knit and it's not a woven, non-woven meaning it doesn't have, woven remember is interlocking at 90 degrees. Everything is at 90 degrees for a woven fabric, whether it's plain, twill or satin. But knit is one interlocking together and this is a knit and then we'll even discuss these. And you have some of these in your book as well. Lace is another one that is a non-woven. So we're gonna talk about all that stuff. You really, it'll be really fun. Okay, screen sharing on the lecture notes then. Let's take a look at those. The first thing we're gonna talk about, I'm, I'm gonna just skip over this for a sec. Let's go directly to the lecture notes. And then we can go to those images. Sorry, I, I apologize. I thought it would stay that way. Okay. The first thing we want to discuss, now that you understand that these are made into different things, but the first thing we want to discuss is the fiber itself. So fiber is the smallest unit that we talk about. I'm going to erase here so that I can um, use this if I need to and go back and forth. So the smallest unit of any garment is the fiber and it ends up being, it's the, it's the, the beginning. So each one of these has a fiber that's been spun into a yarn and then the yarn can be woven, okay? So it's a toss up as to whether you wanna start with fiber or weave. We just started with weave because it gives you something to do, you can go ahead and do that as I'm talking. So these notes are here. Plant fibers are the cellulosic fibers. We have two major categories of fibers, natural and synthetic. We're gonna spend time on natural and synthetic. And so the, these two things, natural and synthetic, come from plant-based material and animal-based. So also known as cellulosic and protein. And this is important because this is part of our fiber identification. When we are looking at fabrics, we're trying to figure out what are they, okay? These are not from plant or animal. I mean, in a way, you could loosely say that they are because they tend to be oil-based you know, or uh, like plastic based. So we'll talk about those as well. But our two major categories are synthetic and natural. And we don't call this synthetic man-made because man-made also can be uh, plant materials that have been chemically changed to create a synthetic or a man-made property. And that happened and we'll talk about that in just a minute as well. Okay, back to the lecture screen share. So natural fibers, which we briefly touched on are plant fibers. They come in three major categories, stalk or stem. They're long, straight, stiff and strong. Think of a piece of celery long and straight. And when you peel the celery off, you get something that looks like a fiber. So flax is very much like that. Flax is used for clothing and that when it's woven into a fabric, it's called linen. It can also be into a very heavy fabric called canvas. So linen, one of the properties, and we'll talk about this when we get into our samples, is that it's crunchy and it leaves wrinkles. And canvas though is very heavy, so it's harder to crinkle up and it tends to be quite rigid. Hemp, 
also used for string, cording, rope, and clothing, more, more recently clothing. But again, it's a long fiber. It peels away and it has a much um, more long and stiff and strong piece. Jute is burlap and it's used for carpet batting, backing, scrim, scrim screen, which is a, um, it's a scenic canvas, a scenic drop that you can see through because of the way it's woven. You can see through it when it's lit behind, but when it's lit from the front, it's opaque. So it has a great property that way. String can be jute. Ramy, also a natural plant fiber used for clothing, upholstery uh, canvases, painting canvases. Leaf products are, leaf fibers are shorter lengths. They're straight. They tend to be like, think about a leaf when you can peel it off, you're using the spine of the leaf and then you have that fiber that's left. Rope, binder twine, it's resistant to salt water. And seed, which is short, fine and soft. And I have some cotton pieces that I'm gonna show you. Um, here we go. This is some cotton seed. When we are working with cotton, we're working with this portion of the cotton it becomes, uh, when it goes to a cotton gin, when it's picked, it has the seed in it. When it goes to a cotton gin, the seed is washed out and discarded. And then they discovered that the seed could be used for cotton seed. This is aligned. And when you get this aligned, it creates a length. So I'm gonna pull this out so that you can see the fiber and it is, can create a length. But again, this is not woven yet. This is just a fiber. And this tends to be about an inch and three quarters, as you'll see here. An inch to two inches is the California Midland fiber. California was the top producer in cotton for a long, long time. And not as long a fiber, so it looks like this when it's in the bowl. The bowl is the a ball that looks like this that spreads open and then you have the cotton fiber inside that goes to the gin the gin separates out the seed it's washed and then the fiber is left but uh cotton was the, one of the major producers it's in the san joaquin valley you can see that cotton is it was a it's a that's where the term cotton is king came from so one of our last um pieces that we have is a filament fiber called sap. So now we're introducing a new term. The plant fibers tend to be shorter, so they are measurable and they are, can be um, measured, even a stalk can be measured into certain length. A filament is a much longer fiber, so think of sap as a liquid, a filament goes on and on and on. So I'm going to then just put up on the board quickly so that you see this. In addition to these two categories of natural and synthetic plant and animal, we have staple fiber. So that's referring, this is referring to the chemical makeup of the, of the fiber or the content of the fiber. But then when we refer to the length, we refer to staple, which is measurable or short, and filament, which is long. And I'm talking unmeasurably long, okay? So let me get those closer to you. So in addition to the content, which is plant or animal under natural fiber, uh, even the sap is a plant material from the rubber uh, plant. Animal proteins we'll be talking about, but then we have staple, which is a measured length, it's shorter, 
versus filament. Our only plant filament is sap, which is rubber. We will also have a filament in animal. Okay, So it's unmeasurable. And think about that. Because if you think about turning on a faucet of water, the water, I mean, we are um, not always in California. <laughs> But when you think about sap, think about maple syrup, you tap the tree, it's a filament, this length comes out, and then it is stretched and dried, and it can be as long as that drip out of that plant comes. So it is a filament. It can be of any length. These others, the stalk or stem, that's rough, roughly 18 to 24 inches. The leaf, maybe. Uh, four to six or eight inches, and seed fibers tend to be, you know, one and three quarter to six inches. When we get something called India cotton or um, Egyptian cotton, and you're talking about very fine woven sheets, and they talk about 600 thread count, and we'll talk about that with that piece of paper that I have included. That's the number of threads per square inch you're talking about a much longer fiber, but still measurable. Instead of a two inch fiber like this, you're talking about a six inch fiber, and that can create a much finer and narrower yarn. Protein fibers tend to come from animals. So fur or hair fibers, are animal proteins. Again, the animal is not killed to do this. So as far as wearing wool, something like that, the animal is shaved. And the that's like your hair, it is cut, and then it can be used. The difference between fur or hair is that hair can grow continuously. Fur has a length, and then it stops. So we have wool, which can be from sheep. This is our primary protein fiber. Alpaca, all of these still come under wool, but generally now they are um, labeling products more specifically so that they'll indicate if it is alpaca, if it is angora, which is can be angora sheep or an angora, uh, sorry, an angora goat or an angora rabbit. Cashmere, which is Himalayan goat, and that's, that is said to be the least agitating of all of the wool fibers. We'll talk about that in a minute. Lamb's wool, which is a younger sheep. Moreno wool, which is a Spanish sheep, longer hair. Shetland, which is Scottish, Scottish sheep, and that tends to be one that's more picky. And camel hair, which is a wonderful, dense um, fiber. And you can think of camel as very short, but it is woven very tightly together. It's dense. It is practically waterproof. It is so dense. So a couple of properties of wool. All of these are staple. And we have the fur or hair fibers are staple fibers. So they're short. They're measurable. Cocoon is a filament. It is, it can be a mile long in one of the tiny silk cocoons. It is, can be domesticated or wild. So when they domesticate it, they take the larva, put it onto a mulberry leaf that eats mulberries pretty much exclusively. And then they can refine this worm to create this fiber. They spin it and then the worm is killed in order to release the silk without the worm coming out of the cocoon. If the cocoon is broken, the silk no longer is a long filament, and it, then it is short pieces. And think about a small cocoon, the worm coming out, then your pieces of silk are this long. Otherwise, silk can be up to two miles long. It's a very, very, very fine fiber about the, about the um, diameter of your hair and it can be extremely strong, generally cultivated in India or in China. So these 
These staple fibers are the ones that are shaved off of an animal or clipped. And then the cocoon is the one that is the, um, the cocoon is where the animal, the worm is put into boiling water. It's put into boiling water because the cocoon is made by the worm excreting this, this fine thread, but also with a gum that creates the wrapping of the cocoon around the worm. And then the gum is released in the boiling water. The worm is then killed and then the, the cocoon is taken out and then it can be spun off or pulled into a thread. And these are wonderful um, warp threads. And when you have a silk garment put together with those two threads, you have something that is very, very durable and very um, warm. So protein fibers tend to create and hold heat in. The original sailing, uh, when we talk about a fisherman's knit sweater, was because it was made of wool, often Shetland wool, so that you wore something underneath it. But if it got wet, it trapped in the heat and it kept you warm. That's why in World War I and World War II, before we had these synthetic wicking fibers, which move moisture away from your body, we had fibers that could keep you warm. So often you'd wear a very thin silk liner sock, and then you'd put a wool sock on top of that so that the wool was resilient. Wool has a kink to it. And so it, uh, let me just talk about some resilience out there. So one thing about an animal is versus plant is they have a bend. There is a bend in this, especially for the wools. It's called a kink. And it can, um, like crepe hair is a wool. It can straighten out, but when it is, uh, when it is released, it will go back. It has a memory. It's called, that is called resilience. Okay, I can't spell that. Resilience. I think that's about right. Okay, that's why fine men's suits are made out of wool, so that if you bend your knee in a pair of trousers and then you release it, you hang the pants out overnight, the, the bend knee is like this. It's stretched this little wiggly out. And then when it's hung, the wiggle will regroup. It has a resilience. It has a memory. So when they talk about a memory yarn, the very first memory yarn was wool. And then ever after, synthetics have been trying to imitate the natural fibers. They try to imitate the coolness of linen and cotton, where the, where the um, air can go through. They try to imitate the resilience and the memory yarn of wool. Now, most of the uh, people in the Mediterranean or that are living in the desert are wearing lightweight wool because it does absorb the moisture and it can dehydrate off of the moisture. It doesn't stick to you. Think about a wet t-shirt sticking to you. Wool does not do that. So it is a really great both summer and winter fiber and we don't usually think about it that way. And just to then go on to our man-made fibers, We have rayon, which is the first man-made textile in 1886. And it is made from regenerated cellulose. So the cellulose in this particular instance was wood pulp. So they took wood pulp, uh, you know, ground up wood, and then they could st stretch it out and create a wood uh, fiber out of this wood pulp and that became rayon. You notice that when you wash rayon, it, it shrinks back together. And when you iron it, it will stretch out and become much more fluid. It is artificial silk, one of the things that's talked about. And then because in World War I, all of the parachutes were made of silk. And as silk got more and more rare, they started trying to make things. Silk was always imported to the US and England. So they kept trying to modify certain kinds of, of plant materials so that you could get silk, 
without having to pay for the silk cocoon. One other problem with silk is that because like I said, when it was heated with boiling water, the gum was released. So then the silk cocoon was lighter and silk was sold by weight. So the cocoons with the gum in them had a certain density or weight. And then once you boiled it and you, to unthread that cocoon to create a fiber, then you had less weight. And that made people mad. And then they would add in things to create the weight so that they felt like they weren't getting ripped off. And that's when we added salts and uh, other minerals into silk. And when we look at things from the 20s and they have what we call um, minerals laid in them, they will rip along that crosswise grain because those salts have eaten away at the silk. Not because the silk is salt, itself is weak, but because the salts and minerals that were added to create weight are weaker. So then we wanted to get artificial silk because that was so expensive. We had to import not only the worm, but then it had to be woven. So generally we were importing the fabric. The product, the textile was created and then the textile was imported into the Western world from Asia. The second man-made fiber, and again, man-made is different than synthetic in that man-made is taking one of our natural products, whether it is plant or animal material. The second man-made fiber is acetate, introduced in 1924. That is really classic along with that use of silk being used up for all of the parachutes in World War I. Remember, air flight came in in World War I partway through. So when then we needed parachutes, all the silk was used for the war effort. There was no more silk stockings. We needed stockings of some kind versus just woolen or cotton uh, knitted ones, which were very heavy. The silk stockings were very luxurious, very lovely on the leg. They made the leg look beautiful. There's always been a market for beauty. There always will be a market for beauty. So acetate is a cellulose with acetic acid. So that eats up the cellulose and softens it. And acetate is a fabulous lining product that we still use. And one of the great things about it is it's breathable. So it's not like our early polyesters, which just suffocated you, but it has also some great movement like silk does. So we have that lovely acetate. And excuse me, just for a sec while I take a drink. Okay. And then we come to our synthetic fibers. These are chemical composition. And you can see what this is. It is a group of chemicals worked together. So a polymerization means taking, poly means taking many, grouping them together of water, ground up coal and petroleum, which we know as a crude liquid. And the beginning of these common synthetics, look how close that was to the cellulose and aesthetic acid, they thought, how can we do this cheaper? How can we make more of it? Do we have to start with a plant? Okay, we're gonna start with coal. Now, you know, this is one of our natural resources. So it is synthesized from rock and other processes, but it's just not as readily available to man in terms of fibers as plant is. Same with gasoline, you would never think of petroleum putting that on somehow, but these incredible chemists came up with nylon in 1927, three years after we got acetate. Polyester was introduced in 1939, the very end of the war, as tourline by the British. In 1946, as Dacron by DuPont. And, so, uh, and 1953 introduced as a numerical fabric. Now, you know, I sort of remember polyester coming in in the 70s. I don't think that it was widely used. It may have been used in industrial um, and commercial kinds of ways. For example, airline liners, car liners, uh, seat coverings, um, rugs, carpeting, other kinds of things that use fabric 
were using polyester, but it didn't come into human garment use really until the 60s. So in 53, introduced as the numerical fabric, and there were problems with it right away, but we get acrylic, in 1944 to 50 as Orlon, and it was actually called Orlon Acrylic by DuPont. And then Mod Acrylic, which is fluffy acrylic or fake fur. You will have samples of all of these in your fabric sample um, swatches. So Mod Acrylic is fake fur and longer Mod Acrylic is wig, is used as wigs. So when we get to those samples, I can show you those as well but mod acrylic wigs, very, very common. And then in 1958, we get spandex as a synthetic rubber because we rubber elasticized things like bras and stockings. And then as people started moving away from, you know, rubber trees and sap and that had to grow in a certain climate, then we had a synthetically produced spandex in starting in 1958. And I actually remember making swimsuits in the 70s and it was a big, I actually made a lot of woven swimsuits on the bias first, but then making swimsuits using a stretch. And it was like, oh my goodness, you can, you don't have to put in a zipper. You can just pull this on. And, you know, um, that was very interesting. But one thing also that I find as a, that's a slight downside of spandex is before we had that and we were making, and I'm not saying myself, but in the 40s when we had those beautiful 40s swimsuits that were shaped and fitted and they went on with a zipper, it's because they were actually using that and it did hold the body in. It did, they were designed and styled in a very beautiful line. The line had as much to do with the style of the swimsuit as the fabric did. And they really did have an incredible different opportunity because the necklines held in shape. They had bust shaping, hip shaping. There was usually a little shirred skirt in front for modesty panel. There was um, diagonal pleating so that you could have a very, you could just emphasize the parts you wanted to emphasize. Then when spandex, we didn't need any of those shaping um, seams anymore or shaping pleats or curves. Everything just sort of became one piece. And I think now we're looking at swimwear and they're going back to some of the older styles, but you're still using spandex. And uh, we will get some samples of this metallic, which is plastic coated lurex. It is when you have a silver or gold fiber in there. Originally, those were spun out of, you know, gold and silver are liquids. They could be very, very, very thin, and you actually could have garments, especially in the 20s, that had real silk or gold threads in them. Then we had a synthetic plastic coated lurdex, sort of like uh, Christmas tree tinsel, but on a very, very fine level. You'll have some samples of that in your fabric identification. And then finally, olefin, which is a polypropylene fabric, and we go from there to neoprene and you'll get a fabric of that as well. So when we have fiber construction, actually um, we've discussed our warp, which is our lengthwise grain, our weft, which is the crosswise grain, the weft wraps around the warp to create the selvage edge. Each one of these warp and weft is a yarn and a yarn is a group of fibers that has been twisted together to create length. So when we have woolen yarn, it can be heavier. Silk yarn is very lightweight. That's why you're going to choose three threads to put into your fabric identification notebook and you will untwist them. Each of these kinds of weaves, you will get a sample, multiple samples of. You will have pressed fabrics, which are both felt, which we talk about with hats, and pellon, which we've talked about. Pellon is our interfacing that we used for our buttonhole, and that was actually a two layer, which had a glue layer and a non-woven pressed fabric layer, very lightweight, pellon, also used mostly for interfacing. Knitted fabrics, 
we will have several samples of knit, single knit, double knit, sweater knits, and novelty knits. And then knotted fabrics, which are netting, tulle, nylon, um, that are used for bridal veils, used for behind skaters uniforms so that we don't get any wardrobe malfunctions, and lace, which is knotted. Bobbin lace is machine, can be machine made, tatting is handmade, other kinds of machine made lace that can be more intricate, but when we get to certain very, when they talk about Battenberg lace, it's lace that's very beautiful, made by hand. And we can have crocheted, which is a one needle um, system of chain stitching and creating lace by using one needle together. Knitted takes generally two needles with one yarn. Crocheted is one needle, one yarn. And then finally, we have things that we'll talk about when we go through our fabric samples, which are fiber finishes. That's something that's put on top of the garment after it's been woven. So for luster, there's mercerization and that create, luster is a slight shine to it. Mercerization, when you had a mercerized fabric, it was something that would need less ironing. So mercerized was supposed to be great, less ironing. Beetling, uh, creating a harder surface. Planering, glazing, creating a shiny surface. Sizing, and this is very interesting. We, you'll, have a, you'll have an example of this in your muslin because you'll have unwashed and washed muslin. The unwashed muslin has sizing, which is rigidity. The wash muslin does not have the sizing or the glue part, which we talked about with buckram. The glue part has washed out and now you have a, a more flexible uh, muslin piece. So that's luster for shine. Another kind of thing is surface design, moiré, when we get that, that it makes your eyes go crazy when you're looking at certain um, broadcasters with their ties. Crinkles. When we crinkle things together, that's a very primitive crinkling, wrinkling pattern, very common, but then it becomes a fashion detail. So then it's a surface design that happens after the um, fabric is woven and it is heat set. Moray is also heat set onto a certain design. Flocking, which is the uh, application of a, of, a, of a fiber on top held by glue and napping, which is an agitation of the fiber, and we'll talk about that when we get to talk about khaki or denim, you can agitate the fiber and it creates a nap or it lifts part of the fiber up. Color finishes, dyeing, dyeing the entire uh, garment. You can yarn dye and then yarn, then the weave will be different based on how the yarn is woven. So we'll talk about that in your fabric samples. Printing, color applied on top in a rhythmic pattern, or painting, and this can be hand done. We've done quite a bit of hand painting. Stenciling, those kinds of things to try and create 18th century design on top of some other kind of, um, on top of some other kind of fabric. We've had painting on top of velvet. There will be all kinds of things that we can talk about there. And then performance finishes. So shrinkage is something that really happens less and less. But the, but right now you can remember shrink to fit Levi's. It was always that Levi's were shrink to fit. There was no other option. You just always had shrink to fit Levi's. They didn't, they didn't make them any other way. They relied on the washing and drying, the washing to agitate the fiber so it could have memory, the drying to have the fiber go together. So wash and dry and they would also do that to have you release that dye finish, which was the indigo dye. And they say always wash separately because the dyeing tends to release every time it's washed, but they'd have you wash and hot, dry and hot, wash and hot, dry and hot so that the jeans would eventually shrink. And that's why it's called shrink to fit because maybe you're buying a 34, but they shrink down to a 31. Drip dry, something that you can take out of the wash machine and hang and not need much ironing, just touch up. And then flame proofing. 
Flame proofing is something that we have done many times on stage. If we're going to use open flame, it used to be required that everything that was on stage was flame proof. That was before we got things like the fire curtain that could come down and protect both the audience and the actors. But it's a liquid that is the garment is either sprayed with or dipped into and then dried. It does change the texture of the finish completely. And it means that you can hold a live match to the garment and it will not ignite for up to six seconds or 10 seconds, something like that. Children's pajamas still have that requirement that you can hold an actual flame to the pajamas and they don't um, ignite. Now, the problem with that is you need to make sure also that they're not one of these synthetics that we talked about earlier up here because these synthetics, and you'll see when we do our dye, when we do our burn tests, synthetics melt. And you don't wanna do that to children's pajamas and then have the pajamas melt on them. That has happened. All of these things have happened. You know, it's just like we deal with all the new information with COVID. Every time we do a new fiber, we have a whole bunch of different things that have to happen before we can actually, before it's actually safe. I mean, all these things are things that you have to deal with. So um, this is the just is just the nuts and bolts of the lecture. And let's then look at some looms. So this is a loom. This is a this is not a, a really complex loom, but it is somewhat complex. The operator would sit here. These are foot pedals. And are you guys seeing this okay? Better? I can open yes. I can make it a little bigger. Hold on. There we go. And let me move it up. I think I'm as high as I can get. So okay. The operator sits on this left side. The foot pedals here operate the battens here, which lift. And they have a set of strings that tie certain warps together so that then the shuttle, which carries the cross grain yarn, can go across easily. So as you put your foot on one of these, this would lift and then the shuttle could go through and just like if we had a shuttle on our little paper weaves does that make sense so we would on our plane weave we have one that would be every other one and the second batten would be this the the opposite so that then we could have it lift and throw the shuttle through to create one side of the plane weave and then the next one would lift so we could throw it through and try the other part of the plane weave and this is how they're tied on. You can see groups of threads here tied on so that they can be lifted together. Now these are warp threads that are dyed into different colors, but you can see that this goes through and they're grouping the threads together. This is a, a wider version of that same thing so that you can see the threads are grouped onto these different battens. This one has multiple, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven so that this would create a um, varied pattern. Sorry, let me see if I can move this over anymore. There we go. I don't know why they don't just line up, but okay. And then this front piece here can press it down so that as we lift this, the shuttle goes through. Look at this white thing right here. These are lifted. It's going through here, and then this will, this will beat against it. So this is going, the warp is going away from here. Oh, actually, we're looking at it backwards. That's why. So this, this will batten it down. Sorry, <laughs> I was, I'm sorry, I was doing it with my hand. So if you watch my little hand icon, this piece of wood goes here and pushes after this shuttle goes through, it pushes the fiber just like we had to push our um, cross grains through it. A slightly different loom. You can see how, oh, let me see what's going on here. 
So this is the warp, although it's not full. This is going to be a finite length, but you can see the multiple battens that could lift things up. They're, ma they're making something that's not so long and it's going to have fringe on the bottom. But as in the beginning, hold on this one, you can see it's making a fringed rug and that all of these, the gray is a cross grain, but the warp has to be red unless this is tied on separately. And it may very well be. Generally, if you're talking about a indigenous rug, you're talking about a linen warp, which is off white, then the, the um, crosswise grain is bringing both the design so you can see this would just be shot straight across and then the color would shift, color would shift, but this has a, a more intricate design down here. So the color doesn't go all the way across, it comes to here and stops. <coughs> and then possibly is tied to complete these and then gray, green, gold, white. And that this yarn is tied on by hand to create the fringe afterwards. But in the next sample, the yarn is part of it. So this looks like it's going to have a pink fringe on the bottom. <coughs> Completely sensible. And this is a practitioner who's using what we call a backstrap. She's holding the warp yarns out with her hand so that she can push the shuttle through. And then she'll grab the alternate warp yarns that she needs. And you can see here is her fabric that's being woven and she'll twist it on this spool, which is a, just a, a dowel or a piece of wood to create her rug or her table runner. So she's holding up alternate yarns and this is attached at the top. This is very traditionally done. Uh, the Navajo, you would use this kind of a system frequently. <laughs> this is another way of tying the yarns on top and then separating them out for a certain weaving technique. And this is a tiny finger loom. So that here we have, it's making a narrow ribbon. See this tiny ribbon that's made. So here we have our, our warp yarn, our shuttles, and it's making just a narrow ribbon. Some, we will have narrow ribbons in our fabric identification. They are simply, uh, it's called narrow fabric and they're one inch, half inch. It's when we get to twill tapes, it's not biased because it's not cut on the bias. It's actually woven this way in a very narrow sense. And then this was that very cool picture of these coming down and creating possibly I, it's not, I can't really tell. I put this in because I love the colors and because it is a, a lot about the way that you dye certain fibers and that you can see them. Okay, and then just your assignment, reading chapter three, characteristics of natural and man-made, your weaves, the stretch and bias. So there you go. That's the end of the lecture portion for um, the Canvas site. I'm going to just take a moment and show you a couple of yarns. <clears throat> Let's talk about yarn for a moment. So this is a standard thread. You may think that it's simply one, one piece, but it is multiple pieces twisted together. And if I untwist this, let's see what I can do. And you guys know from trying to thread a needle that you can untwist this into multiple yarns. And this is probably the finest, not super fine, but. So when, depending on the number of yarns that's twisted together, this is called ply. Okay, so you can see that this is two ply. You can now see the twist in it, as soon as I get my big fat hand out of there. Okay, you can see the twist and the kink created from the twist. 
So this is two ply. It's two yarns that have been twisted together to create one thread. All thread is multiple ply. And so two ply is fairly strong. The reason why you wanna do to apply is because PLY, just apply, is because if we have just one piece, it could shred apart, okay? Because as you've twisted something, you're twisting shorter fibers into a longer fiber. So when you put multiple twisted fibers together, you're making something that's much stronger, okay? That makes sense. And you can see that this is then clearly two ply. And you can now that I've just agitated it, you can see that this would be much less strong because it's not even twisted anymore. Let's look at something that has more of a ply. This is why I want you to look at thread. So there's just regular thread. Here's a cording. And if we untwist this, You can see I'm untwisting it and it will look at how it's loosening up already. You can see the amount of ply. Let's see if I can pull them apart. It always gets a little winky. There we go. There's one. And two and three. So this is a three ply yarn. It has the kink, again, from being twisted. The twist creates the kink. Unlike wool, which grows this way. Wool grows in a kink, and that's why when wool is twisted together, it is much better as far as trapping in heat. And you can see that this is a much heavier yarn than this one. The two ply, the gauge, in other words, the diameter of each of the fibers here is less than this. So even though this is three, it's a much thicker yarn than the yellow one because each of the, each of the gauge of the yarns here is heavier than each of the two here. Now, when we get into a very large piece, of a yarn. This is a single yarn. This is wool. This has been done on a hip spindle. And you can see that if I untwist this, it's not different ply. I'm just going to untwist it and it will create yarn. I can pull it apart. Okay. And this is wool, dyed wool. But you can see that it's not individual yarns. It's just one yarn that has been twisted together for strength, and if it's untwisted, it loses strength and it can just be separated into these individual fibers. So the fiber is the smallest quantity. As you twist it together, you're creating yarn. When you have multiple, uh, multiple fibers twisted together, you get ply so that those things are terms. Let's work those on the board for a second. Fiber is the smallest increment. And then it's twisted into yarn. Ply is uh, using more than one twisted, okay? So if it's two ply, it's two yarns. Even though this is one yarn, uh, and this is a, you know, this is a thing that would be knitted together so knitting is going to create a different um, sample. 
even though this is one, this would not really be called, we wouldn't say one ply, it would just be called yarn. Two ply is two or more, three ply, three or more yarns. Wait, there they are. Okay, so that's kind of helpful. Um, a couple of things. I'll show you this when I get, when we talk about knitting, but this would be different when we get to knitting, I'll demo how this works because this is the backside. And this is, again, I said one yarn, two needles. Crochet is one yarn, one needle. And it's a series of loops. And yarn can be varied, both thick and thin. And that can be a property that is desirable. So that this is called a slub when you have a thick part and it is planned into the garment to use the slub. When you get a skein of yarn, it's a hank like this, and we saw that in that one picture. And then if I was going to use this as a knitted piece, I would then roll this into a ball. My mom was a big knitter and she would put her skeins on the back of the chair like this and then go around the back of the chair and roll them into a ball. But I wanted to show you this one because this it has a little bit, this is a two ply yarn. You can see how you can see that separation there. And this is one called in the, it's still in the in the grease or in the oil, this is an unwashed fleece and I can feel the lanolin here in my hand from the animal versus washed, which is then not, it doesn't have that kind of thick feel to it. And then this would be a linen um, warp thread used for the looming, uh, the, the warp loom um, this is from a backstrap loom that I made with the Navajo Indian. So that's why it's on this twig. I went and camped there and lived there. And you can see how many ply this is. So that warp yarn in a rug is going to be very strong. It's one, it's a six ply. Okay. And this is linen. So linen is very long and it's harder to pull apart than the, than the um, wool, which is a staple, or then if it was cotton. And that's why they use the linen to create that warp yarn. Okay, questions, comments? So we're stopping the lecture now so that you can have time to work on your paper weaves. And then when we come back, on Wednesday, we'll tie this all together with our paper samples. And you will want to have labeled each one of your grid sheets so that when we glue our fabric samples down, you have them indicated. So I'm talking about these. This is your little packet that you got. And each one of these gridded sheets, you'll want to label so that you have four of them. And please label them plain weave. Neatness counts, make them look pretty. Twill weave so that you are ready to glue down your samples. So have a glue stick and your fabric piece is ready. And this is gonna be non-woven. So for Wednesday, uh, if I, I'll try to write this down as well. I'll put it in the notes. Four labeled sheets and a glue stick and your fabric sample. And we will discuss how this uh, we can do this now since we just talked about thread count. So understanding thread count is a sheet that is included in your um, packet. And I talked about having um, 
when I took my textile class, we actually had to count thread count. So you take, you have a very small microscope that ha has exactly one inch. And you look at one inch. Of fabric. Okay, and this will be very easy when we look at our cheesecloth. We'll be able to do this. Sometimes cheesecloth is wiggly. So we're going to assume this is one inch. In order to get the thread count, you add the warp. which is my lengthwise grain plus the weft. So if I'm going to count this thread count that I've made, pretending that it's one inch, I'm going to count my warps, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. I have 11. 11. And I'm going to count my weft. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Well, isn't that fortunate? So if I have eleven plus eleven equals a thread count of twenty-two. Now imagine those sheets that are six hundred threads per square inch. So 300 this way and 300 this way in one inch. That's why you need a that's why you need an excellent magnifying glass to look at that. But this piece of paper that we've that we've included understanding thread count will show you exactly how to do that. And what that means is the higher the thread count the more durable the fabric is. When it's loose thread count and we'll talk about this in the very first sample which is cheesecloth, it's very see-through it's not durable, but there are some times when you want to use that kind of a cloth. And in the makeup class today, we're gonna to use that and we're gonna put it with latex to have, to create a fiber. So sometimes you want loose, less dense thread count. Sometimes you want a high thread count. Generally the high thread count means that it is more likely to wear longer and to be a more durable fabric. So just, just throwing that in there. So that's why it's part of your packet. And please come with your, your grid paper and your glue stick. Okay, questions? All right, I'm gonna end the recording. Bye-bye. <laughs>